What is the state of America's health? You know, interesting question. You know, I, as a practicing cardiologist, I'm seeing patients on a regular basis. And um, from my perspective, I see the sickest of, of individuals on a routine basis. So I'm naturally skewed to say that the state of America's health is very poor. But even with that qualifier being there, uh, as I, you know, observe people who are not the type of people who come to my office, the type of patients who are sick and, and needing the, the mm -hmm. care of a cardiologist, I would still say the state of America's health is poor. Uh, the vast majority uh, of us, about two thirds are on at least one or two prescription medications. There are many individuals who are on over-the-counter uh, medications uh, for some minor or moderate ailment. So the fact that we are you know, requiring prescription medications, um, the fact that there's a lot of disability, those things are the routine, uh, our state of health is very poor. And, and, and the other commentary along those lines is the fact that so many young people uh, are sick. So illness, chronic illnesses, type two diabetes, high blood pressure is a normal thing among people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And, and this is a, a noticeable change from when I was in medical school, um, which is you know more than 30 years ago, but a uh, significant change. So the state of our health is poor. It may have been poor back when I was in medical school, but it's definitely poor now. What are your thoughts on this passage from Gary Taubes, author of The Case for Keto? Keto diets are based on the proposition that for those predisposed to become obese and or diabetic, carbohydrate-rich foods trigger that predisposition. That isn't because of the calories they contain, as the conventional thinking on obesity assumes, but because of the effect these foods have on insulin, the hormone that dominates the regulation of fat storage and fat metabolism. Insulin is secreted mostly in response to carbohydrates, not just in the form of sugars, starches, and grains, whole or otherwise, but also fruits and legumes, which are the staples of a well-formulated plant-based diet. A high insulin level signals fat synthesis and storage, and a low level, it's release as free fatty acid back into circulation, Observe the Harvard University metabolism and diabetes researcher, George F. Cahill Jr. in 1971 in the prestigious Banting Memorial Lecture at the annual meeting of the American Diabetes Association. This process is like a switch. When fat cells sense the presence of insulin in the circulation, as Cahill described it, they respond by storing fat and inhibiting its release, and we get fatter. But when insulin is undetectable, we burn stored fat for fuel and we get leaner. The metabolic state of ketosis, from which the keto diet gets its name, happens when carbohydrates are restricted almost entirely and fat provides most of the fuel for the body. The hormonal insulin-centric regulation of fat storage and fat metabolism remains textbook medicine, yet its relevance to obesity has been effectively ignored by nutritionists and obesity researchers who have overwhelmingly preferred to think that all calories are equally capable of stimulating fat accumulation, that we get fat because we overeat, not because the carbohydrates we consume have some unique ability to stimulate fat accumulation. For some significant proportion of Americans, however, remaining relatively lean and healthy may require minimizing their insulin secretion. This, in turn, means more or less rigid abstinence from carbohydrate-rich foods. Animal source foods, meat, fish, fowl, and even processed meat, typically make up the bulk of this approach to weight control because they are almost entirely protein and fat with minimal carbohydrates. Until insulin was discovered in 1921 and insulin therapy was put to use in treating diabetes, these diets were known as animal diets. They were the standard of care for diabetes, delaying death in what today is called type 1 diabetes, the insulin-dependent form, and controlling the, the disease indefinitely in those with type 2, the common form associated with excess weight and age. This is still the case. So again, doctor, what are your thoughts on that passage from Gary Taubes? <laughs> I took notes as I listened. <clears throat> so... Um, a number of things here, and, and, I'm, and, and the notes I took are basically on the salient features. I, there's a lot of, there are a lot of words there. 
Um, first and foremost, um, um, when you mentioned carbohydrate rich diets, um, that term doesn't mean very much to me because all carbohydrates are not equal. And then if you say a given carbohydrate, let's say a potato, a potato that's boiled is different than a potato that's, you know, uh, fried, deep fried, et cetera. So just to use the term carbohydrates by itself is not enough, but I'm going to put that comment aside and come back to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the comment regarding insulin, uh, there's data showing in individuals who are not even diabetic, but insulin resistant, um, if they're on an animal protein diet, uh, they've done muscle biopsies and shown intracellular fat accumulation in those individuals. And then when they were put on a plant-based diet, the intracellular fat accumulation was shown to uh, uh, regress or reverse. And so, you know, that's some evidence that these are thin people who are insulin resistant. They weren't obese, et cetera. So just the mechanism of insulin resistance was shown uh, to be reversed by the removal of animal protein. In our studies that we published, we took individuals and they were on a uh, plant-rich diet. Uh, and we defined it as a defined plant-based diet. I'm going to get to that in a minute. <clears throat> We, uh, in just four weeks, now this group of patients that we recruited were individuals who uh, had hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Those were the inclusion criteria. Uh, they had an average BMI of about 33, 34, something like that. Um, and their uh, baseline hemoglobin A1C was 5.9. So they were not diabetic. They were pre-diabetic, but they were not classified as diabetic, and we did not recruit them as diabetic. Some were, and many, many were not. Uh, so with that baseline finding, we put them on a defined plant-based diet, which is a minimally processed uh, plant-based diet, which follows a, 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 a proprietary food classification system that we use. Uh, on that regimen, in just four weeks, we saw a reduction in blood pressure, reduction in cholesterol. Uh, there was a greater than 5% weight reduction. But we also saw a reduction in hemoglobin A1C. And I think we were the first in the medical literature to show a reduction in, in hemoglobin A1C in just four weeks. Uh, and, and that's an important uh, factor there. We were also the first in the medical literature to show a reduction in lipoprotein little a in just four weeks, which is an atherogenic molecule that even if that's elevated and your cholesterol is normal, you're still predisposed to heart attack. So with a defined plant-based diet, uh, these biomarkers show significant improvements and the patients had a 40% reduction in their medications. Now, <clears throat> back to the diabetes. The important part about the reduction in hemoglobin A1C is the following. Hemoglobin A1C is the average blood sugar over three months. Now, I just told you that we showed a reduction uh, is about a 3.4% reduction in hemoglobin A1C in just four weeks. That's one month. So the question is, okay, how is it that you can show a reduction in the parameter that's an average of three months in just one month? And the reason is that the other factor that influences hemoglobin A1C is the fluctuations in blood sugar. So if you have a fluctuation, if the fluctuations in blood sugars are great, then that's going to increase the hemoglobin A1C. If the fluctuation in blood sugars are reduced, that's going to reduce the hemoglobin A1C. And so I argue that our reduction in hemoglobin, A, hemoglobin A1C was related to the reduction in the fluctuations of those blood sugars that we saw over that period of time. So then you say, okay, that's fine. What are the, the, the fluctuations? These people weren't giving themselves insulin. Uh, there are very few, maybe one or two people may have been on insulin, but they weren't, they weren't diabetics. And so you shouldn't be seeing fluctuation based on medication. Uh, we did not measure this, but my theory is that the postprandial blood sugars when you're consuming an animal protein diet are probably going to be much higher than if you're consuming our defined plant-based diet. So when you get blood sugars that swinging, it's going to be a postprandial uh, effect. So if I eat a cheeseburger and fries, then I'm going to get much higher blood uh, sugar swing uh, than if I'm eating, uh, you know, a salad or an apple or whatever the case is. So these postprandial blood sugar changes are probably what's triggering that increase in hemoglobin A1C, even though the average uh, uh, fasting hemoglobin is gonna be you know, relatively normal and decent in these patients. 
And so I think that's the mechanism there. Why am I pointing this out? Our patients were on a uh, minimally processed carbohydrate rich diet. And so uh, and on the carbohydrate rich diet, they still do not have these uh, blood sugar swings. That's one. The other point that I can uh, use based on our clinical experience to dispute this is that in, in Montgomery Heart and Wellness, we've been uh, following patients uh, based on a diet uh, for a very long time, almost two decades. We've had thousands of patients. Uh, a simple majority of those patients are diabetics. We have from our own experience, diabetics who are on you know, 60, 70, 80 units of insulin that I can put on raw fruits and vegetables, you know, uh, juices and smoothies with fruits and vegetables in them and see the blood sugars go down, see the hemoglobin A1C go down. We've not done this with five patients. We've not done this with 10 patients. We've done this with hundreds of patients, over a thousand patients, really over the, the, the 15, 16 years we've been observing patients that we've seen our diabetics have these numbers go down inflammatory markers go down, et cetera, as well as the weight. So the argument that a carbohydrate rich diet uh, potentiates you know, insulin resistance uh, is not borne out by the published data and it's not borne out by our evidence over a thousand of patients that we've seen nor our published data that we've seen where we've shown an actual reduction in the hemoglobin A1C. So the words I hear you um, read it's probably more theoretical conjecture. What I would like to do is find out if Mr. Gary Tapps have some medical evidence of showing a keto diet, you know, reversing diabetes and showing a reduction in hemoglobin A1C with a keto diet of four weeks uh, and, and showing these actual numbers in science. So point me to the science and then, then we can talk. What are your thoughts on this passage from Gary Tabbs, the author of The Case for Keto? <clears throat> when I started reporting on this subject as a journalist 20 years ago, virtually no meaningful research had been published to test the claims of the diet book doctors, most famously Robert Atkins, who advocated this way of eating. Since then, carbohydrate restricted diets, keto or otherwise, may have become the most tested diets in history. The website, clinicaltrials.gov, reports more than 100 clinical trials of ketogenic diets in progress and nearly 90 completed. The findings are consistent. Ketogenic eating is safe and effective at controlling both weight and blood sugar. Pick a disease from Alzheimer's and anxiety disorders to traumatic brain injury and tumors. And researchers somewhere are probably testing whether eating a ketogenic diet improves its prognosis. In 2019, the American Diabetes Association concluded that low carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets, that is keto, were the only dietary therapies that consistently resulted in beneficial outcomes for adults with diabetes or prediabetes. In 2017, more than 100 Canadian physicians co-signed a letter to the Huffington Post declaring that they personally follow keto-like regimens and now counsel their patients to do so too. What we see in our clinics, these physicians wrote, is that blood sugar values go down, blood pressure drops, chronic pain decreases or disappears, lipid profiles improve, inflammatory markers improve, energy increases, weight decreases, sleep is improved, IBS or irritable bowel syndrome symptoms are lessened, etc. Medication is adjusted downward or even eliminated, which reduces the side effects for patients and the cost to society. The results we achieve with our patients are impressive and durable. So again, what are your thoughts on that passage from Gary Tabbs? Well, I mean, uh, the first comment regarding all the literature, I'm, I'm, I'll just have to say I'm not familiar with the literature. I'll have to look that up. I, when I looked at the data on keto diets, I've not seen anything showing reversing of diabetes or reduction of hemoglobin A1C or reduction of uh, you know, uh, IL-16, uh, uh, I mean, uh, lipoprotein little A or IL-6 is what we showed. I just haven't seen the data. And, and when we did our search, uh, in terms of looking at what diets have shown a reduction of hemoglobin A1C in four weeks, we didn't see a keto diet. Uh, when we looked for what diets have shown a reduction in uh, lipoprotein little A prior to our publication, we didn't see the keto diet. Uh, and so when we looked for these things, we didn't see the keto diet in these parameters. So I'll 
do another search. Uh, but our publications have been out for uh, nearly two years now. And, you know, prior to that, we not, had not seen keto diet publications showing these changes. Um, the second part to that regarding di- diet doctors' uh, remarks in terms of what they're seeing in their patients, uh, I'm not going to doubt that the doctors are seeing those things. Uh, what I'll say is this, and you have to watch this over time and see how the patients do over time. And, and we see our patients chronically get better over time. Uh, you know, we have angiographic data of, of coronary artery disease improving um, and lots of other data of our patients getting better and medications being reduced. Um, and i have just not seen those publications with the keto diet. So uh, until I, I see the publications uh, and maybe Mr. Tapps can, you know, uh, email us some articles uh, uh, and manuscripts, then, you know, I'd be glad to look at them and compare them to what we've done. What are your thoughts on this next passage from Gary Taubes, author of The Case for Keto? No meaningful experimental evidence, no clinical trials exist to support the contention that we would live longer, healthier lives by eating mostly plants rather than animal sourced foods. Well, so if you use that term, no meaningful clinical trials, and, and that's typically what um, uh, they do in, in big industry uh, because they design these, you know, prospective trials and, you know, they cost a lot of money. And so, yeah, you can make the argument that no one has gotten a large prospective trial using plant-based diet. Uh, there's a lot of observational data, the China study data, and there's other observational data, but from a prospective uh, 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 double-blinded study, we haven't done that. Uh, I don't think that's a necessary um, thing to do. You can look at the evidence from the blue zones uh, and other things where people that eat mostly a plant-rich diet, uh, it contributes to their longevity. Now, granted, there are other factors, you know, being outdoors, lower stress life. So there are many other factors. It's a multidimensional uh, factor when you're talking about longevity. So it's, it's not just what you eat. If you're eating a perfect diet, but if you're leading a stressful life and you're not sleeping and so on and so forth, many of those things will catch up with you as well. So making that argument becomes a very complex argument because there are many factors that lead into longevity uh, and, and the diet is just one of those things. So uh, that's correct. We haven't done a large prospective study, but what I can say is that if in the short run, you know, if in the short run uh, you have, you know, worsening uh, blood pressure, worsening cholesterol, worsening other parameters with a keto diet compared to a plant-based diet, which is my experience, um, then it's likely that the plant-based diet is going to contribute to greater longevity compared to the keto diet. And I've had many individuals on a keto diet who come to me because their cholesterol is elevated. I had a patient we had to put a stent in his proximal LAD. He had been on a keto diet. He had coronary disease on a keto diet. And he was on lots of supplements. And we had to stent his proximal LAD as a result of the keto diet. Uh, And we got him off that and put him on a plant-based diet. So the point is that you can have this, you know, you know, theoretical conjecture that, hey, there's no long-term prospective studies. But, you know, Everything, one, a long-term prospective study doesn't give you all the answers. Two, uh, nutrition is one of many components to longevity. So even if you did a long-term prospective study, you probably would show some longevity, but there'd be other factors that you'd have to control for. Uh, And and three, in the short run, the keto diet, in my experience, uh, is inferior to the plant-based diet. So it's unlikely that that's going to contribute have a greater contribution to longevity than a plant-based diet. How does a man protect against prostate problems? Well, you know, Dean Arnish show that consuming a plant-based diet uh, had a reversal effect on individuals with early prostate cancer, in which case they were in a waiting stage. And when they went on a plant-based diet, they showed that uh, you had a, a reduction in the PSA and they actually showed some biochemical changes in the telomere lengthening. So that's one thing a plant-based diet can contribute to. Cancer, however, is a a much more um, complex animal. So I think optimal nutrition is one, uh, but 
there are other factors. I mean, we are in, uh, you know, we're faced with, you know, increasing MF. We're around cell phones and, and computers all the time. There's a lack of outdoor exposure. So, I mean, being outdoors, I mean, the vitamin D is one of probably many benefits of being outdoors. So, um, you know, outdoor contact, being uh, in contact with the earth, grounding and earthing, uh, those types of things, um, you know, proper sleep. So really uh, protecting against prostate problems, quote unquote, and prostate cancer being the key, uh, one of those problems is, is going to be a multifactorial, uh, 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 you know, uh, event where it's going to be optimal nutrition, which is a minimally processed plant-based diet, so antioxidant rich diet, but the other aspects of the lifestyle is going to be, uh, will be important too, especially talking about not only prostate issues, but other forms of cancer. For example, what gets into your water? I mean, there are many municipalities that has, you know, uh, poor filtering system. And, and I'm not just talking about, you know, Flint, New Michigan and other parts of the country where, I mean, here in Houston, we found that, you know, there's a lot of radiation in the water and various other toxins that, that you know, we have to filter out uh, at the home level. So there are many other factors that you have to look at that, you know, chemicals and toxins get into our system and we have to be vigilant about uh, being aware of those things and, and guarding against it. Do you recommend bariatric surgery? You know, the bariatric surgery, um, so let me step back and, and speak from a broad perspective and then come into bariatric surgery. Um, our approach at Montgomery Heart and Wellness is an integrative approach. So by that, I mean, um, it is one where we will use uh, the alternative treatments, if you will, nutrition, optimal health, you know, fresh air, sunshine, exercise, uh, proper sleep, all those things as your foundation. And then we uh, add the, you know, standard Western therapy as an adjunct. Now, depending on the acuity of the patient, so if someone's in the throes of a heart attack, we'll say, oh, yes, go get a stent or go get your bypass or whatever the case is in that situation. That's an acute event. And so then the, the Western therapy uh, is at the forefront, but the, but the natural approach is there too, because I'll do a raw detox even while they're in the hospital. Uh, and so we use that integrative approach in a sense that saying that, you know, it's, it's not either or, but, but, but in many cases, both and, because, because some people, many people are so sick, they need something aggressive. Having said that, uh, in the context of bariatric surgery, I think it has a place for, you know, certain individuals. Uh, but it should not be bariatric surgery in place of optimal nutrition and these things. It should be bariatric surgery in addition to. And so the patients I'm treating, whom I may refer to bariatric surgery, I will put them on a plant-based diet. I put them on a raw juice detox. I may have them do smoothie feasts or juice feasts to, to reduce inflammation uh, in preparation for going for that procedure. So um, I, I, I don't say that it's something that I don't recommend. Um, a good friend of mine, you know, Garth Davis, is a bariatric surgeon, and, uh, and I think it benefits a lot of people, but it shouldn't be something that's used in place of optimal lifestyle and living. What should a man or woman do if a mammography, MRI, or other diagnostic test finds something in their body that could possibly be malignant? Should they biopsy it? Should they remove it? Should they treat with mainstream protocols? Should they consider alternative protocols? You know, it all depends. So um, if, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of details uh, in that that you need to know, but, but generally speaking is the following. Uh, if you are found to have some malignancy, uh, or some abnormality that is thought to be a malignancy or could be a malignancy. So the question is, should you have it biopsy? Uh, it depends on the specifics of that malignancy. So let's say, for instance, someone has an anemia. I'm going to give you some, a few hypotheticals. So if someone has a, an anemia and you say, well, gosh, your hemoglobin is eight and the you know, lower limits of normal is say 12 and you're fatigued and you, know, you don't have, you're not a female with heavy periods or whatever the case is. And so you get a colonoscopy and, you know, you see, you know, some large polyps. Uh, so should those polyps be biopsy? In that setting, I would say yes, you know, biopsy the polyps and see what's going on, see if there's cancer and stage it. 
in, in that setting, you, you, if you're at a point where you have malignancy or lack of malignancy, then the consideration of an integrative approach is reasonable, especially when you're dealing with something like cancer. So uh, I've had, uh, I'll give you some example. We've treated patients with multiple myeloma, some patients with um, uh, advanced uh, liver cancer, one with advanced colon cancer. And uh, the patients with uh, the one, well, I'll give one patient with multiple myeloma, elderly man, and we were in an integrative approach. He received aggressive intravenous nutrients, high dose vitamin C, uh, he did raw detox cleansing. We did like 15 to 20 days of juice feasting with intermittent raw cleansing. Uh, he did some hyperbaric therapy and so on. In addition to getting his uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents from the cancer center. So we were treating him in parallel. He also had some uh, renal, had like stage three renal uh, chronic kidney disease as well. And so what we were able to do is that with the intervention that we applied and we started our natural intervention slightly before they started the chemotherapy, we actually got regression. His renal function went from stage three to about normal. Um, he had chronic back pain and some other things. Those things pretty much went away or, or severely subsided. Uh, and he actually did extremely well with the treatment of the multiple myeloma. Similarly with the patient with the, the uh, hepatic, uh, she had a weird a rare uh, biliary cancer. And we started treating her in a natural approach and she did extremely well. Our oncologists didn't, they were surprised at how well she did. Um, I use those two examples, there are others, but I use those two examples to say to make the following point. When you're that far along of cancer, you may need everything. So let's say for instance, I'll give you this hypothetical. Uh, let's say for instance, you have, you know, a bunch of, um, you know, uh, 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 criminals or street thugs out there. They're rioting. They're getting ready to tear down a bunch of buildings and you got to get it under control and you got to send your policeman out there to settle things down. And you may have to use tear gas. Well, you may not want to use tear gas, but you may have to use tear gas to settle that those bad guys down. But if you're a policeman out there, you don't want them to succumb to the tear gas. So what you do is you give your policeman gas masks. So your policemen have gas masks. The bad guys don't have gas masks. You use the tear gas. The bad guys will succumb to the gas mask. Your, your policemen will not. In the examples I gave you with the patient with uh, advanced cancer, when we treated them aggressively with plant-based diet, uh, super nutrients, vitamin C, other nutrients, MSM, what we did is that we essentially protected the healthy cells. And that's like the gas mask on your policemen. And then the toxic material, i.e. chemotherapy that went in, destroyed the cancer cells, but the natural, the normal cells had some level of protection because they had high dose of antioxidants and, and other nutrients that fortified them against the harmful effects of the chemotherapy. So that integrative approach, especially in the setting of cancer, I think is, is very beneficial uh, in setting. So having given that context, going back to the original question, you know, if you see a mass here, if you see that, should it be biopsy? I think there's some validity in doing that because you wanna know what you're dealing with because your therapy for that needs to be with a full understanding of what you're dealing with. And you may use some chemotherapeutic agents. The issue with chemotherapy and radiation therapy and those things is that they do a great job of destroying cancer cells, but they also destroy the normal cells. And what happens is that you wipe out your immune system, you, you have cardiac failure and all these things, and the person doesn't change your diet. So you're destroying your normal cells with the bad food, you're feeding the cancer with the bad food, you're destroying the cancer cells and the normal cells with the chemotherapy. And so you get going to remission and then it comes back. And by the time the cancer comes back, your, your normal immune system, your liver, the heart, those things haven't come back. And so by the time you've You've hit the body multiple times with these rounds of chemo. Over a period of time, your liver, immune system, et cetera, can't tolerate more chemo. They said, well, we've given you all the chemo we can. And then the cancer says, we'll be, we're ready to come back and fight uh, because your normal cells have been destroyed by the treatment of the abnormal cells. So when an integrative approach, super nutrients, aggressive therapy fortifies the normal cells, those cells are fortified that didn't fight the cancer cells. 
So in the examples I gave you, you can argue that, well, maybe the chemo killed the, the cancer cells, but maybe also those fortified you know, normal cells, the immune system and light killed the cancer cells too. So it's like two to one. So yes, I would do the body. You want to get the information. Once you got to the point where there's a spot here or mass there, you need to find out what it is and address it. Uh, whether you get chemo or not is another story because that depends on what it is and what stage it is and what the options are. What have been the results over the last 15 years among the patients that you treated with standard medical care for cardiovascular issues versus the ones you treated with diet and lifestyle? You know, I haven't done a, a, a head-to-head comparison from, a, from a, a standpoint of saying, okay, these guys got only the um, uh, standard cardiovascular care and these guys got you know, the nutritional care plus standard and only nutritional, largely because we offer it to everybody. And so it's, it's, it wouldn't be a, a, everybody's their own control. What I can say is that those who comply with our nutritional recommendations more do better. And that's just been our observation. Uh, that's, you know, uh, evidence based on the studies that some of the things that we've published. So we do know that individuals who follow the healthy lifestyle have an advantage over individuals who just follow uh, the, who don't follow the healthy lifestyle, uh, who just follow the cardiovascular therapy. And then one thing I'll, I'll put as a footnote, it, the compliance on, on the standard cardiovascular care, we, we say that, you know, people follow standard cardiovascular care as though everybody's fully compliant with that. And the, the compliance with these medications is, is very low because oftentimes people have side effects. They may not take the diuretics when they're out and about, um, you know, if they get a headache with the beta blocker, they may not take it every day. The statin, they may take once or twice a week. It's, it's very common, very common for patients to come in and tell me that I'm only taking these medications, you know, once or twice a week, or certainly not as prescribed. And so that so-called cardiovascular care, we're not sure what that is either because there's uh, poor compliance there. And frequently it's because of side effects of those therapies. Does a whole food plant-based diet prevent against getting all heart attacks and strokes? <laughs> so great question. Now, um, I'm going to say, I don't know the answer to that question in a pure sense. And here's why. When you say whole food plant-based, and I had lots of patients come in and say whole food plant-based. And that's why our program uses what I call a defined plant-based diet. We use a food classification system. Etc. And the reason is this, and even if you threw in low fat, let's say low fat, whole food, plant-based uh, diet, does it pre prevent heart attacks? We've had people come in. So like I've been vegan for 10, 15 years. I've been whole food, plant-based 10, 15 years. And, and I still have high cholesterol, heart attack, or still have coronary disease, et cetera. And, and when I talk to a lot of these patients, um, uh, the other factors that are involved that are non-nutrition factors. So that means you know, are you getting out and getting fresh air, sunshine, sleeping, that type of thing, which is important. But let's just say that they're all doing those things. But even in a whole food plant-based diet that's low fat, if you're microwaving your food, you're eating a lot of GMO food, you're eating a lot of, you can still eat processed foods in a whole food plant-based diet in people's mind. Because, you know, if I say whole food plant-based low fat, um, that means a lot of things. That's not a very precise definition. And so, you know, people then translate to be vegan. And yes, they'll eat a lot of greens and a lot of natural stuff, but then they may eat a lot of processed rice, a lot of microwave stuff, a lot of instant oatmeal and so on and so forth. Because I see these patient, patients coming in. They say, I'm eating a whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet, uh, and I'm still having these problems. And then I get into the nuts and bolts. How are you preparing your food and where are you getting your food from and what's in your, and I say, bring me samples of your food. So when you get into the details, it becomes very problematic. The, what, what we try to do is we have a food prescription program where it's level zero to 10, where 10 is the worst food in the world and zero is the optimal food for nutritional detoxing. And it's based on not only it being plant-based, which are the lower numbers, but it's also based on the fact that it's um, uh, minimally processed. So, you know, raw foods have a lower number, which is a higher rating then cooked foods, then dehydrated foods, and so on. So we'd like to be more precise when we're prescribing food in terms of what people are eating, because there's so much that's done to food nowadays. There's, there's the GMO, uh, even the organic stuff, you know, may be shipped and, and uh, uh, 
pre-harvest uh, it before it's ripened. Some of it may be frozen or gas, and all these things can have uh, an effect on the nutritional benefit of the foods. And so, you know, there are a lot of factors in there. So I don't want to just sort of blanketly say a whole food plant-based prevent against all heart attacks because there are a lot of details that are not being sorted out in that statement. Is there a difference in the age of the people who come to you now with a heart attack compared to when you first started as a physician? You know, that's a great question. And um, the, I will say yes from the standpoint of the quantity. The very first heart attack patient I remember taking care of, quote unquote, when I was a medical student, I was a third year medical student. Uh, during my internal medicine rounds at uh, University of Medical Branch in Galveston. And uh, the first heart attack patient was a 32-year-old man. So 32 at that time, and that's more than 30 years ago, uh, was the first heart attack patient. So uh, symb symbolically, you know, that set the stage. Now, I've had patients younger than that who've had heart attacks uh, since then. But I would say the reason I said yes is about because I'm seeing more people of a younger age coming in with heart disease than, than I recall seeing when I was uh, um, in, in my training. When does someone need heart surgery and when can they instead use diet and lifestyle? When is it too late to use diet and lifestyle? Well, um, great question. When can someone use heart surgery? I don't like to say instead. So they, um, Diet and lifestyle should always be the treatment for anybody and everybody who's alive. So that addresses the last question. When is it too late? The only time I haven't had people respond is when I went to the graveyard and sprinkle, you know, green smoothies and juices over the graves and nobody responds. So we've yet to get response there, still working on those studies. But beyond that, we see that um, everybody responds. I'll give you an extreme example to make the point. I had a patient who was on life support. Actually, it was, this wasn't the only person, but one of few. Uh, this patient was on life support. She had chronic lung disease, heart failure. I had implanted a defibrillator in her and she had gone to the hospital. She had pneumonia. She was in a long-term acute care hospital, a very small one here in Houston, a number of years ago. And I happened to be the medical director there. That explains why I was able to do some of the things I was able to do. Anyway, so she started going down this whole slippery slope of multi-organ uh, uh, dysfunction, cytokine storms, kidney started failing and so on. Um, I consulted my colleague and friend who's a nephrologist to start dialysis. The family refused. Just look, we don't want it on dialysis, even though it, we thought it'd be temporary, but they didn't want that. So I said, I'll tell you what, you know, let's do this. I felt if she didn't have dialysis, she'd die. Let's try. And I just gotten into the realm of treating patients with plant-based nutrition. So what I did with her she, had, she was intubated, so she couldn't swallow food, but she had a peg tube. So what I did with her is that we made green smoothies with uh, using a super green smoothie that had, you know, uh, macro algaes and other super nutrients, all organic, powdered in a, you know, in a powder form. We mixed it with water and we squirted it through her peg tube. And I started taking her off the, off the uh, other tube feeds. And I essentially detoxed her there in the ICU in the long-term acute care hospital. Uh, we weaned the medication. She started putting out copious amounts of, of, of sputum and mucus through the lungs. Uh, and of course we suctioned that out. But the long story short to that is that she walked out of the hospital. So that was a situation where someone was on life support uh, in sort of an early cytokine storm with multi-organ dysfunction. We detoxed her. All of that stuff started to reverse and she walked out of the hospital. So it's certainly never too late. And there's no, I don't look at it as an either or. Did she need the dialysis? Well, I guess she did because she didn't have it and she did okay without it. But, but even if she had gotten the dialysis, the detox would have been beneficial as well. Yes, she needs the ventilator. Yes, she needed all the other aggressive therapies. So having said that, yes, there are patients who need surgery. When do I recommend surgery? When they have severe disease and uh, let's say they need bypass surgery, they have severe multivessel disease, uh, ejection fracture uh, or the pumping function of the heart is dec de decreased. They have other factors. What I would do with that patient, and we have patients that we've done this with, I'll start them on a raw detox and a cleanse prior to surgery. So I'll get them detox and cleanse 
before going to surgery, and then we get them set up for surgery to, to bypass those vessels. Would it be possible for that whole condition to reverse on the natural diet? It, it would be possible. In that situation, they're somewhat in a, a dire straits. In other words, the surgery could benefit by uh, improving revascularization in addition to what we're doing with the diet. So it's, it's using both interventions. Uh, if the person did not want surgery, we certainly could treat them with the optimal nutrition. Uh, we do this therapy called ECP therapy, external counterpulsation therapy, which improves circulation. It's, it's, it's actually a, a substitute for bypass. We have patients who refuse bypass. And we've actually do this therapy for them uh, in place of bypass. And it's worked very well in conjunction with our nutritional regimen. So the point is that, yes, there are times that I need surgery, also severe valvular disease, uh, severe valvular regurgitation, severe valvular stenosis. Uh, these things can be uh, improved uh, with optimal nutrition, but it may take a longer period of time. And also you're depending on patient compliance, uh, which is the other factor that, that, that you know, plays into all of this. So in severe disease where uh, surgery, the data shows that surgical correction has a beneficial impact. I'll then recommend surgery in conjunction with an aggressive lifestyle intervention, uh, with the lifestyle intervention leading the way to prepare them for the surgery and also through surgery as well. Does a whole food plant-based diet automatically bring your cholesterol level down to a healthy level? Um, so great question. A couple of little um, uh, traps in that. Um, in my experience, a whole food plant-based diet, uh, a minimally processed whole food plant-based diet brings the cholesterol down. Now, that other little snippet that you threw in there to a healthy level, uh, that's a relative term to uh, if you say, does it always bring it down to guideline recommended levels? Uh, that's the case, the answer to that is no, I've not, and, and there's certain situations where um, individuals who have uh, genetic predisposition for hyperlipidemia, I've had several of those patients where I bring the cholesterol down a lot, but it doesn't come down to say LDL less than 70. Um, in those situations, uh, I'm starting to use very high doses of, um, of, of vitamin C uh, and other uh, antioxidants as an adjunct to what I'm doing with the nutritional regimen. Um, and so there are a lot of factors that go into that. You have the genetic predisposition, but also that person with that genetic predisposition has been living a standard American lifestyle for a very long time. And so there's some aspects of you know, what's happened at the biochemical level that, that has, that's difficult to reverse just with a plant-based diet. And we use detoxes, intermittent fasting, all of these things have healing effects. And, and you have to, so just say a whole food plant-based diet, again, you know, a lot of cooked foods and the like, I don't think is going to be enough for many individuals. We have to put them on intermittent detoxes and, and, and various other regimen in addition to, to super nutrients, uh, high dose vitamin C, uh, and other things that improve glutathione function, uh, improve uh, uh, coenzyme Q10 in the case of heart failure with patients uh, and the like. So we do a number of things in addition to a whole food plant-based diet for people with severe uh, problems such as you know, severe hyperlipidemia that's genetically uh, predisposed or heart failure, other things as, uh, uh, of the like. Do you recommend statins? Um, I do not routinely recommend statins. Now I have prescribed them for patients who don't comply with the nutritional regimen, you know, as a, uh, you know, board certified cardiologist and, and working in the standard arena, uh, there's a, a guideline directed approach to things that it's, it's not exactly a law, but <laughs> maybe it's, it's one of those written unwritten laws. These guidelines are what are recommended. So for instance, if I have someone who I, recommend aggressive lifestyle and they don't comply with that and their cholesterol is high, then, you know, I have to provide, 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 um, uh, prescribe a statin drug. So the answer is yes, I do. Um, in situation where, uh, patients do not want to, or are not able to comply with the recommendations of, uh, of healthy lifestyle. You work in the world's largest medical center. Have you told them about the results you get from lifestyle medicine and 
what do they say? Why don't they adopt your program? Who is resisting the change? <laughs> so um, I've given grand rounds to the CV surgeons on two occasions. <clears throat> I've given grand rounds to uh, uh, a group of OBGYN uh, physicians uh, on one occasion a number of years ago, and I've shared my data. Uh, they, they are, I mean, the, and many of these guys are my friends and colleagues. We work together. We, you know, I refer patients to them and the like. And so, and they're wonderful people. It's, um, so there are two things. I, you know, maybe the fault lies on both sides. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm not pushy enough. And, and I think there's some reality to that. And I'm so busy in my, my little laboratory doing things. Uh, and uh, I, I think I need to be more of an evangelical, <laughs> if you will. And, and, and I think, you know, and I, I say that and chuckle, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm serious about that. So I, I'm, I'm going to have to lay some of the blame on my side because I think the enthusiasm and fervor that I show with my patients is not necessarily the enthusiasm and fervor that I show with my colleagues. Um, uh, however, I, mean, I plan to work on that and, and fix that. We've got some more research coming and I plan to share a lot of that, uh, especially some of the biochemical stuff that we're doing. Uh, so that's one reason. So the other reason is I think that, uh, my friends and colleagues are very hardworking and well-meaning and, and everybody's out there doing the best that they can do. The environment, if you will, the, the medical environment, the, the training that we have and the, the post-training uh, work environment that we're in is all controlled by the outside system that is pushing, you know, uh, drugs and devices. Uh, when you go to our meetings, all of our societies and all of that, the standards that are created, you know, I mentioned, alluded to, you know, guideline directed therapies, you know, our guidelines are all controlled by, you know, big pharma, big device and big whomever. And so, you know, they can go and pay for these large studies. And then once the study is over, they get a result, they rush over to New England Journal and then, you know, they'll pay them or, you know, you know, influence them to get it published. And then it becomes a New England Journal article. And then, and that's in time for the next meeting. So then they get on the, the docket to present it at the meeting. And so they've got these million dollar, you know, booths and they're presenting their, you know, their data at the meetings because, you know, they support these meetings. And so they're in prime time. And so there's a, there's a disadvantage from the stuff that we do because we don't have, we don't control the cameras and the microphones that issues that, you know, that dictates who's at prime time. Uh, and so, so what's in front of them and what they're bombarded with on a day-to-day -day basis and also psychological, there's a psychological factor this too. Um, and, uh, you know, just like we had the coronavirus, we're going through all of that. You know, many people are afraid of it because there's a psychological component that goes beyond what the science may or may not be. Uh, but the point is that the psychology behind a lot of this, you know, among our professionals is that these drugs are needed, these surgeries are needed and so on. And oh, by the way, lifestyle is good, but a lot of people won't do that. So I can't spend my time on that. But uh, it, it, be, it behooves me and people like me to be more uh, uh, evangelical about this approach and say, look, this is what needs to be done. And yes, patients can comply. Yes, they do comply. And these are approaches that you have to take, the systems that you have to set up uh, to help them comply. But um, yes, in the lar world's largest medical center, uh, we haven't turned the tide yet, but I'm still here and I'm still, I still have a few tricks up my sleeve and, and, uh, 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 the final chapter hasn't been written. I'll put it that way. Should we eat whole food plant-based fats like raw seeds, raw nuts, raw olives, and avocados, or should we limit them? Uh, we should eat them, yes. Now, I say that based on my data. Um, we don't restrict these foods. In our published data, we had um, individuals uh, who were had hyperlipidemia, high blood pressure, average BMI 33. And we had, again, a defined plant-based diet, uh, avocados and seeds. Uh, we, we, we recommend seeds over nuts. Oftentimes nuts may be, um, may be shelled in a way that heat is added. But the thing I stipulate with my fats is that they have to be raw. They cannot be heated. So 
any food that's greater than 20% fat by caloric, you know, count, uh, and, and by our recommendation should not be heated above say 120 degrees for sure. Um, the reason is that, uh, and our whole seeds may be more stable at higher temperatures, uh, but to be safe, we just reduce it because oftentimes you don't know if people are grinding the seeds or not. So we just say we keep them at a lower temperature. Um, if you cook the fats, they become rancid. If you extract the oil from the fats then the oil becomes rancid. So the fats that are raw are, are beneficial and, uh, and necessary. And in, in our regimen, we had, uh, when we did the dietary look, uh, it was about a 20%, just a little shy, a fraction of a point shy of 20% fat. So I just said it's about a 20% fat diet. And the consumption of avocados by the people on our diet increased by ninefold. I'm gonna say that again. The consumption of avocados in our study increased by ninefold. And despite that, you have reduction cholesterol, reduction in lipoprotein LA, first ever show that, reduction in hemoglobin LC. So, you know, I think these, well, uh, not what I think, it's not important. What the evidence shows that these foods, at least in this study, did not do harm to these patients. From a health standpoint, should we try to add oil, such as flax, hemp, and olive oil to our diets, or should we try to avoid it? If we do use it, should we avoid heating it up? Yeah, so our recommendations are to avoid oils uh, at all costs. We haven't looked at any studies saying, okay, we have a whole food plant-based diet, no oil, whole food plant-based diet with oil. Um, you know, what difference does it show? I, I, I want to do that study to, to really, so, you know, we recommend no oil and that, I think that's the right answer. Um, we, um, we have to do the investigations because I don't want to just empirically say no oils. I think the right answer is no oils, but there are a lot of variables there. I mean, if you're getting a truly cold pressed oil and it's not rancid, you know, does it cause harm? Um, I think it does because one, you can't really control for that. So maybe if you have the perfect oil in the world, maybe you can get away with that. But the, the, uh, the two reasons I don't recommend the oils, one, I think the oils inherently are problematic. That's, that's what I think. Um, and, and even the raw oils. Now, I don't think we have a lot of data on just the purest, purest raw oil, but I still think the purest of pure raw oils are problematic. That's one. Two, even if the purest of the pure oil was problematic, and you say, okay, you can have the purest of the pure oil, but the other oils you can't have, then people will extrapolate and say, well, he said that I can have oil. And all the, 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 the oil, you know, uh, um, you know, commentary and, 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 and the like will be forgotten. And the only thing they're going to hear is oil. So they'll be frying their, you know, you know, okra and oil, uh, cook a salt in it. And that's all cooked oils. You shouldn't have a cooked oil. So that's why we just say no oil. But I, I think someone needs to do a study where you have the, the purest of the pure oil that you add to a diet that has no oil, but it's defined plant-based you know, 100% raw, cook both of them. And that's the only difference is the oil and see if you can measure a difference there. And then you'll have, get some information as to where it's that pure, so pure oil, whatever that definition would be. How do we help poor people who are growing up in areas that serve mostly unhealthy food? Well, what I do with my patients who are in that situation, I tell them to stop eating the bad food. I mean, you know, um, the, I don't care where people are, they're going to do the right thing uh, as best they can. And um, I've had a lot of patients who were on food stamp or welfare. We're trying to get our, our nutrition center. We have a restaurant on site nutrition center. We're getting it certified for food stamps here in Texas. Uh, but an, an individual coming to the food say, look, when are you going to get your food stamps? You know, you know, we want to come in and spend our food stamps here. Um, people who want to do the right thing will do the right thing, regardless of their economic, socioeconomic status. And if they're in my office and they don't want to do the right thing at first, then they're going to hear me badger them until <laughs> they do the right thing. And if they keep coming back, that tells me they keep wanting to hear me badger them because, you know, they, they want to do the right thing, either sub whether subconscious or not. And, and what I do is I take away all the excuses. I've had patients who, you know, they're on fixed income. I've had a homeless lady on plant-based diet. 
I had several homeless people. One lady was homeless and she came and did a detox program. And yeah, we spotted her some food here and there. But once she started, she was depressed on antidepressants. She got so much better. Uh, after that, we weaned off antidepressants and so on. Uh, so, you know, people have the will to do the right thing. And, and, and if somebody is in a poor neighborhood, they need to eat a, a, a healthy diet more than somebody who's in a rich neighborhood. Now, that's kind of an overstatement. But, you know, when everything's against you, you need to start to fortify yourself from within. And so that, that's the population, the people that I work with. Uh, and it did, I work with every socioeconomic status and, and individuals in that situation. I say, look, here's what you do. Uh, you lo- learn how to grow something in a pot. You learn how to go to this store, this store. You go to supermarkets and you negotiate. I've had patients. I had an elderly lady on, you know, fi- she says, look, I can't. You know, I, she had bad rheumatoid arthritis. Her, you know, fingers are all the, 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 the form. And, and old frail lady. And, and so she wanted to do our smoothie detox. I said, well, I can't afford just smoothies. I said, what do you mean you can't afford our smoothies? Have you tried to negotiate the price? What's your budget? You know, give me a number. And I got my nutritional manager and said, look, here's her budget for the week. I want you to calculate something where we make a profit and, and she, we make her budget. And we did that. And the lady, she detoxed. She went from, you know, using a walker to carrying heavy smoothies out and walking out and detoxing. So, what I tell them to do is that don't put barriers on yourself. I don't care where you are, sleeping on the streets or what, figure something out. If you don't have resources, be resourceful. And, and I teach them to go to the supermarkets and negotiate. I write them a prescription, raw fruits and vegetables for heart disease. And I say, you go take this to the produce manager and say, look, I've got bad heart disease. My doctors have got to eat raw fruits and vegetables. I only have $5 a week. And I tell them if their budget is $15, tell them the budget is $5. And then tell them to get all the fruits and vegetables, $5. And if they get their supply, they got $10 saved over. Put that in the stock market or something, whatever. The point is simply this. Uh, you just have to be resourceful. And what I do is I, I encourage them, I motivate them, because that's essentially what people need. I don't know what their situation is, but I do know if they're, they're, if they're down and out, you start with here. And I start with here for my patients. I say, look, you know, you're going to do that. You have to do this. So you're going to do this. So once you make up in your mind, you're going to do it. Then the rest becomes process. OK, so I get them to make up in their mind. They want to do it. Once they make up in their mind, they're going to do it. Then we figure out what the process is, whatever the circumstances uh, dictate. What's wrong with cheese? Don't we need calcium? Well, calcium is in a lot of plant foods, seeds, uh, sunflower seeds have a lot of calcium, a lot of greens have calcium. Uh, cheese have a lot of bad fats, uh, casein, protein, triggers inflammation. So, uh, you know, especially, you know, cow's cheese and, you know, dead animal flesh forms of cheese. So, so you can, you can get calcium by many means other than just eating, you know, cheese from an animal protein milk. Is chicken and fish healthier than beef and pork? Uh, no, not in my, not based, not on my estimation. There, there are bad aspects to both chicken and fish. Uh, you know, there's some, you can look at some aspects of red meat. So, okay, red meat has more of this in it, which is a toxin than chicken and fish. And so based on that parameter, it's, it's worse, but it, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, the, the, you know, the sprinter is faster than the hundred yard dash, but the, the big, you know, shot put it can throw the shot bit farther than the sprinter. So, I mean, who's the better athlete? I don't know. They both do something different. That's better than the other. Uh, these, you know, red meat does something, you know, bad to you better than the chicken does, but the chicken has something bad, better than the red meat. So you just got to avoid it all. <clears throat> is there anything we can do to nutritionally, to help prevent against a bad case of COVID if we get it. What should you do if you had COVID nine months ago, but the symptoms still haven't gone away? What we're doing with our patients. So, um, and, and again, I prescribe it for my patients. So first and foremost, our patients, uh, we recommend uh, uh, a minimally processed antioxidant rich diet. So that's important, number one. Number two, uh, I recommend my patients get outside on a regular basis as much as they can. Uh, try to make it a minimum of an hour to two hours a day. Uh, I also try to have them do uh, grounding. So I have them you know, get in their backyard. If they have a backyard, I go to a park, 
take the shoes off, you know, lay on the grass, you know, exercise outside in the grass, fresh air, sunshine. So antioxidant rich diet and, and um, grounding. Now we have a several protocols as prophylaxis for, um, for COVID-19. I have a lot of patients who are not indicated for the vaccine. So uh, they're older, older people weren't studied and, and many of them have you know, immune compromising situations and the like. And so for various reasons, they were left out of the study. And so I don't consider them candidates based on the fact they were left out of the study prim primarily. So given that, uh, we've placed them on you know, high dose uh, 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 superfoods, antioxidants. We use a blue green algae. We use a high dose liposomal vitamin C in our, uh, for our patients uh, prophylactically. Uh, if they contract an upper respiratory tract uh, infection, we use a grapefruit seed extract. Uh, we have a supplement that has quercetin with zinc. Uh, of course, we use high amounts of vitamin D, especially if the vitamin D levels are low. That's a you know, big uh, demarcation as to who got sicker with the lower, the ones who had lower vitamin Ds got sicker. So we use vitamin D as an adjunct as well. Uh, individuals who were at special, special risk, uh, I'll write prescriptions for ivermectin uh, prophylactically and also therapeutically in addition to the supplement. So this is the approach I'm using with my patients. Uh, and we've had a number of people contract uh, coronavirus and we've uh, had them uh, put them on a detox. Uh, there's one particular uh, patient I treated with coronavirus. Uh, she had become ill, was vomiting, had fever, uh, you know, passed out, went to the emergency room, was you know, positive, was very sick. Uh, we put on the regimen I described uh, above without the ivermectin and Within four hours of starting the grapefruit seed extract, quercetin and zinc, vitamin D, uh, and uh, blue green algae, uh, she was feeling better within four hours. And the next day, she was completely back to normal. And we've had similar responses. I've had a group of uh, patients who were about 10 days into it, so they were a little bit sicker. Some went to the emergency room and got steroids, but I put them on the same regimen, and they turned around. We use uh, things like curcumin for uh, the myalgias and pain, the headache. I don't recommend Tylenol. Tylenol reduces the... Uh, acetaminophen, I'll say it this way, acetaminophen reduces uh, production of um, glutathione and probably has other anti-mitochondrial effects. And so we don't recommend that for pain and fever control. We use a, a concentrated liposomal curcumin uh, in our regimen, and uh, that's been very helpful for our, our patients. What do you do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's, and memory loss? Yeah, those are challenging. Um, you know, I recently lost my dad to dementia in uh, November of last year. Now, dad was a chronic smoker and uh, we didn't get him off the cigarettes until his dementia was pretty advanced. You know, dementia, you get to a point where you're, you're, you're still cognitive enough to, you know, say no, <laughs> be taken seriously, although you don't remember things as well. So he was at that point where he was still doing some, you know, doing all the you know, unhealthy things. And then he got pretty sick in 2018. I put him in the hospital. We were able to keep him on a plant-based diet. Uh, his dementia was advanced enough to where, okay, he was more compliant with what we were recommending. So he stopped smoking and ate a plant-based diet. And we did improve his, his, his um, uh, quality of life for a prolonged time until he, for, you know, for a few years until he died. Um, what I will say is dementia is such an aggressive disease and, and the dealing with brain function, you really wanna catch these things very early. Uh, so early on, obviously natural lifestyle, uh, minimally processed plant-based diet is what we use, fresh air, sunshine, exercise, but also you want to exercise the brain. So we, we try to get our patients to do things that require cognition. So, you know, I don't know, crossword puzzles or something like that. But also uh, exercise and more specifically dance exercise and various things that require, you know, uh, coordination, you know, your mind and your body. So if you, you know, I was taking jazz dance lessons the other a few years ago and I, I kind of go in and out of that. My jazz dance skills are horrible. I used to be, you know, somewhat OK when I was in medical school. But um, when I was working with my private instructor, she would choreograph uh, a routine and I'm terrible at these choreographed routines. And so it took me a while to get it down, but I was thinking to myself, I'll work with this. So, you know, this is an excellent way to, you know, maintain uh, excellent mental activity 
It's the dance and have to do complex steps because it's forcing the brain and body to work together. And uh, I mean, you build myelin when you use something, a piano player that practices the piano all the time is building myelin to protect those neurons that, that control the fingers, et cetera. And so the more you're building myelin to protect, you know, these areas that, you know, with dance and coordination and that type of thing, the more you're improving your ability to function at, at, a, at a higher level at an older age. So what we're recommending for our patients, in addition to the lifestyle things, is that we're starting an on-site medically supervised exercise program. So we're going to get our trainer on board to start observing a patient, especially once it, as it gets warmer, uh, to start doing medically supervised exercise where they're outdoors, number one, but doing high intensity, you know, interval training, uh, where she does a number of different exercises that brings about muscle, muscle and brain confusion. And so bringing about muscle and brain confusion helps tax the brain, tax the muscles at the same time. And you want to do this type of thing on a regular basis because you want to exercise those things. So instead of deteriorating the body with bad food and deteriorating body by sitting indoors all the time around all this EMF and deteriorating body, you know, with, without movement, you're going to improve this function, improve brain function, body function by being out and exercising on a regular basis because you're going to train these, these uh, synapses. That's my theory. So that's our general approach to that. What have been the results over the last 15 years among the patients that you treated with standard medical care for type 2 diabetes versus the ones you treated with diet and lifestyle? Well, clearly in the last 15 years, the one with type 2 diabetes, the, the, the diet and lifestyle has, has, has proven to be very, very effective. Um, we, we, we routinely wean them off medication. Now, I have a different approach from managing my diabetic patients, my type 2 diabetic patients. First of all, we, we, we tend to more loosely control the blood sugar. By that, I mean, I'll tell my patient, if your blood sugars are below 200 milligrams per deciliter on a you know, fasting basis, on a regular basis, then uh, we're good with that. I'll continue to decrease your medications as long as your blood sugar stay below 200 milligrams per deciliter. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that 180 is a good number. It just means that that I'm okay with that number and I'm okay with removing uh, the medications as long as your, your blood sugars don't go above 200. So that's one. And two, we then are very aggressive in doing interval, back to the so-called interval training from an exercise standpoint, we do interval training from a nutritional standpoint, where we will have individuals go through an intermittent detox periodic. So maybe two or three years, of, two or three times a year, They'll go to a raw detox where it's raw fruits and vegetables only and uh, for 30 days and they come off and eat, you know, from zero to six. Again, not eating fried or sauteed food, but, you know, plant based with some cooked foods and some raw. And so the intermittent cleanses and detoxes, it does several things. One, it helps the taste buds uh, change. And so it gives them a craving for cleaner and cleaner foods all the time. And two, it sort of jumpstarts, sort of like a bolus intervention uh, to the biochemistry. So the cells heal at a faster rate. And so your body's sort of going to a stair-step process of healing. So healing is a progressive thing. It's not like, okay, eat your you know, plant foods in 30 days, everything's gone. No, you know, these people have been you know, uh, destroying their bodies for decades. And so it's a process over time that healing is a process over time that's necessary. So we carry them through that process. So now back to the type two diabetics, the individuals who go through that process and are staying on that course, uh, they stay off the medication, the blood sugar stay in good shape. Uh, and, and there's just no problems. There are many patients who, who are on insulin and other agents uh, and um, uh, their, their, their numbers remain controlled and they remain healthy and so on. Sometimes they may regress a little bit, but the way they regress, I have a patient 95 years old and, you know, we've been seeing her since she was 89 and she came in with, you know, bad arthritis and other issues and diabetes. And she was on, had been on insulin for 50 years or no, had been a diabetic for 50 years on insulin for 40 years. And she got off insulin the first three days. Now she's been off insulin, you know, since we've been seeing her. Now, does she regress? Yeah, she regress. How does she regress? Oh, I've been eating too much cooked foods lately. That's how she regressed. She does better on raw foods. 
but sometimes she drift and eat, you know, too much cooked foods and, you know, she feels worse. And so she goes back to more raw, she feels better. And so, you know, we, we work with her in that regard, but, you know, our patients just do so much better when that foundation, that foundation of consumption of natural, healthy food is there, exercise, fresh air, sunshine, those things are being added. And then you may have drifts here and there that we may have to address things, but but that foundation of plant-based diet, uh, I have many examples, patients with chronic lung disease and various other problems who are doing much better than they would be doing otherwise if they were not eating this way. What do you recommend for someone with eczema? Uh, I don't see a lot of patients with eczema. So I can only recommend removing dairy. Uh, a colleague of mine is a pediatrician uh, sees kids with eczema. And one thing she shares with me that when she removes the dairy from the diet, uh, the eczema goes away. So, you know, I, I would sub subject to removing animal protein and particularly being focused on the dairy products. What about eggs? Are they healthy? What about egg whites? Yeah, we don't recommend eggs of any type. The, the, you know, uh, Neil Barnett says, you know, the only two problems with the egg, the, the, uh, the, uh, yolk and the white. <laughs> so I guess you can take that and run with it. But no, we, when we've had individuals come and they're only eating eggs and we just remove the eggs, their cholesterol comes down. So we don't recommend eggs in any form, not even the shell. Why was it important for you to come back and speak with us here at the Real Truth About Health Conference? You know, I think the conference is a great conference. You, uh, my goodness, you, you've you uh, had uh, all of the superstars at the conference over the years. I've seen the videos uh, online and, and it's it's a very powerful conference. It was the, the very first conference in my opinion was very powerful. I mean, even though it's gotten bigger, I think it's 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 it was always a great conference from what I can tell. And, and, and I think you guys have, have done a great job at putting on uh, a very informative conference and you've brought together great minds from different, you know, uh, avenues um, uh, of uh, the natural healing community. And so, you know, you, you can only do better and, and uh, the world needs more of you. So whatever small amount I can contribute, I'm glad to do that. And, and so I'm glad to be part of the, uh, the solution. And we are grateful that you are, and it's been a privilege to have you today and, and uh, hear all about what you're up to. So thank you very, very much for your time and for all of your meaningful work. Well, thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure and I always enjoy doing this. Thank you again, be well. All right, you too, thank you.